So first of all, I want to thank you for joining um, today's meeting. It's the fourth event of the Try to Read Book Club. And this is the, the DC Tri Club's first book club. And we just started in this winter. And we meet roughly every other month. And we just moved it to a new time, Wednesday, 7 p.m. So hopefully this is a better time. And we discuss endurance theme, theme books. And we also keep the conversation going on the Facebook page. And we meet by Zoom, and you're welcome if you want to. You can be on a trainer, a treadmill, taking a walk in your neighborhood if you phone in. Um, we want, we encourage that kind of multitasking. And also, since it's Zoom, anybody can join. And if you need you know other athlete readers that aren't in the DC Tri Club, we encourage you to share the um, link and invite them to join. And all our, all our events are free. Our events include both author talks, and we also have you know, traditional book club meetings. And we definitely welcome book suggestions. And we haven't decided on our event, our book for the next event, so please send in your suggestions. And most importantly tonight, we're really excited to host author, an author of, best, of a bestseller from 2009, Chris McDougall, and it was Born to Run. And that's why you're all here tonight. And just before getting into the meeting, I wanted to tell you a few housekeeping ma matters. Chris is gonna talk for about 20, 30 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A. And if you have questions, please keep yourself muted during the meeting, but I'll be monitoring the chat box and send your questions to the chat box. Then I'll, ask, I'll um, serve as the moderator and ask Chris questions. And I hope that you have a really good time. And I'm gonna turn um, the mic over now to Kent, who's gonna tell us a little, who'll give a short introduction of Chris, and then we'll, we'll hear from Chris. Okay, Ken. I'm Ken Murky, a professional running and triathlon coach who's researched running techniques to maximize efficiency and injury resistance. And in 2008, I got a call from this guy, Chris McDougall, who told me he was writing a book about the Tarumara Indian tribe and how their running techniques help them to excel at ultra distance running. And uh, he'd seen my evolution running DVD and, and asked if I could teach him the techniques. I'd never heard of Chris and I'd never heard of the Tarumara, but he seemed like a cool guy. So we we met at my studio in Annapolis then and uh, we ran over videotape of his technique and worked on the fundamentals. And he's not a lead runner, but he's very coordinated. So he picked up the movements very quickly. Um, I had no idea at that time that his book was going to reach number three on the New York Times bestseller list or sell three million copies because um, my book has sold 300 copies. So um, uh, after the book came out, then we had him down to three different running stores to do book signings, and all, in including one was Potomac River Running, um, which is the, the club sponsor. And each time the, uh, the lines were all the way down the, down the sidewalk. Um, I also wanted to mention, um, Mark Cucuzella is a friend of mine who, um, just published recently a book called Run for Your Life, and he's on here somewhere. I think he had to, to click out to take a call from a patient. Um, uh, but uh, what, what most impressed me about Run for Your Life is it is, he wove an incredible amount of scientific information into a story that uh, everyone found interesting and they couldn't put the book down. But by the time they got to the end, they'd learned a tremendous amount um, of material that would have been dry just by itself. Um, also, he, uh, the, the book significantly changed the running shoe industry. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you guys have all read about that, but the, the, all of the running shoe companies have adjusted their approach. Um, and Chris, I want to talk about the Vibram a little bit, um, the five fingers. Um, so anyway, uh, that's, that's how I got introduced to Chris, and uh, I'll just hand it over to him. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ken. And um, to everybody else, please be tolerant of my Zoom technique. This is my fourth Zoom, and only the third where I actually figured out how to turn the video on. So you're only the third time anyone's ever actually seen me on a video. So if the background's weird, or I'm jiggling around, or eating peanut butter and jelly sandwich, that is from uh, lack of experience. But, you know, to follow up on what Ken was saying, I remember, Ken, our meeting so vividly because all this was so brand new to me, and I really believe it was brand new to most other people. 
Um, I'm sort of curious about your experience because my experience as a guy back in 2007, 2008, who considered himself a, a pretty reasonably knowledgeable athlete uh, and journalist. You know, I was writing for Men's Health and Runner's World. Um, I was the Restless Man correspondent for Esquire magazine, which had me doing extreme athletics around the world. So I, I kind of thought I, I knew the stuff. And the one thing, like the one number one law that you always saw anytime you want to do anything about running was before you do anything else, go to your running shoe store and have them tell you what shoe to wear. Like that was the gospel. And it sort of implanted in my mind, and I think in the mind of most people, that running really kind of begins and ends with the shoe. You got to get the right shoe and then everything else follows after that. And then I come across Ken and I started reading up on you. And I don't know what first, what kind of Google search first triggered my attention to you, but you were one of the very first guys, if not the first guy, who was talking about technique, you know, technique over technology. And you were the person who was writing about the fact that when you ride a bike, you don't just hop on and go crashing around, you learn technique. When you jump in the water, people don't just say, hey, swim the way you swim. Everybody has their own swimming technique. You're like, hell no. The more efficient you are, the better your technique, the less your chance of injury, the greater your chance of success. And then Ken said, and this applies to running as well. And honest to God, either I was completely naive and ignorant or else nobody else was talking about this because I don't recall any other people vocally talking about running technique. In fact, all I was hearing was, you really shouldn't tamper with your natural running form. Everybody's got their own God-given way to run. And if you mess with it, you're going to create all kinds of other problems. And Ken was basically like, F that. Of course, if every other action on earth has a physiologically more efficient way to perform, then why is running the only activity that's exempt from this law? And so, again, I was curious about this. I went down to Ken's uh, workshop. I worked with Ken, and um, this is the second thing that was a revelation to me was there are actually biomechanical drills. You know, you never saw that anywhere, you know, 10 years ago. There were not people telling you, do the drills. All you were told is mileage, you know, couch to 5K, miles, miles, miles. No one ever talked about technique, about the drills you can do to break the movement down into consecutive blocks, which when then reassembled, would make you a better runner. So this, this was an eye-opening experience. From there, I had the opportunity to go down to the Copper Canyon and meet, you know, the, the legendary Caballo Blanco, uh, Micah True, the white horse. And he's a pretty, he was a very, very gruff personality. And a man of few words, even fewer if they weren't F-bombs. And uh, it, to me, it was like a perfect yin and yang because from Ken, I got the sophistication, the analysis, the bedside manner. From Caballo, I got the extreme performance. This was a guy who had been a professional fighter in Boulder, Colorado. He was actually a ranked fighter and had this kind of conversion moment. He had a bike crash and a bad romantic breakup. And he just chucked it all, moves down to the ass end of the world into the bottom of this canyon because he wanted to learn from the Tarumana, learn how to run. And he'd been down there ever since. So when I got the opportunity to travel down there, track this guy down, what I wanted to learn from him essentially is, is what Ken is saying true in your experience? You as a guy who's run 200 mile races, who's lived with a tribe that routinely is running long distance into their 70s and 80s, is what this guy, as a scientist and coach in Annapolis telling me, does it actually measure up to what this indigenous group has been doing for 400 years? And the answer is absolutely yes. Because what was so cool was when I got down to the Copper Canyon uh, and I had time with the Tabumada, I got to see a lot of people run all the time everywhere. I got to see old dudes just kind of running across the canyon to visit their buddies. I got to see kids running uh, races during recess at school. I got to see Caballo running with his buddies. So all kinds of people, different ages, different genders, 
Um, and what I saw, though, which was striking to me, was uniformity of performance. They all ran the same. The running technique was identical, which is, again, something you never see in the U.S. Uh, if you go out to your average half marathon and you just watch people go by, if there's 20,000 runners, you got 20,000 different running forms. Everybody's doing their own thing. Their arms are going one way, shoulders, everything's different. Yet, when I'm watching the Tabo Mata, extraordinarily similar running form from six-year-olds to 16-year-olds to 60-year-olds, men and women. And so that got me questioning, well, clearly there's no Ken Yerke down here teaching them. So how is it that somehow naturally and coincidentally, this entire tribe is running with a uniform technique? Uh, and I think it's basically two things. Number one, primarily, is that because running was indispensable, it was a matter of life and death. It wasn't this luxury they indulged in for 45 minutes before they had to get back to work. This was something that was their only form of transportation. So if you know that I got to get up and cross this canyon, it's going to be 30 miles, you're not going to bash it out as hard and as fast as you can. You're going to take your time. You're going to relax. And goal number one is going to be efficiency. You're going to be relaxing. You're going to just try to move with some flow. Um, that's, that was the first thing, was this prioritizing of efficiency and ease and relaxation. And number two was the footwear. Because, again, the striking thing about the Tarumata, besides the consistency of their form, is the fact that they're all running in the thinnest of homemade sandals. You know, a chunk of discarded car tire with a leather thong holding it on, and that's it. So again, a lot of this has become familiar to us over the past decade or so, but back then, to me, this was like mind-boggling. I'd never heard of barefoot running or minimalist running, and so I'm watching these guys, and I'm asking, how is this possible? Like, how can you possibly run 100 miles in these thin sandals? And that's when Caballo gave me the answer. He was saying that, look, the reason why is because they're not relying on the shoe to correct their technique. Their, direct, their technique is already like platinum plus. The shoe is only providing a thin layer of protection. So I brought this information back with me to the US and I started to throw the net out there wider and wider, trying to find a little bit more corroboration. Because again, this was new to me. I wasn't quite confident about it. I wasn't sure if it was gonna work. I started to experiment with it myself. Uh, I had an opportunity for my second trip down to the Copper Canyon, and this was for the race that I chronicle in Born to Run. And at that time, I met, my, I met my first barefoot runner. I met Barefoot Ted, which did absolutely nothing to like calm my concerns about this barefoot running shit. Because if you meet Barefoot Ted, or if you've ever had the opportunity to see him talk on video, you know, he, he's like this shy of a raving lunatic. Um, you know, he, he's just off the wall, he's extravagant. But a funny thing about it is, Whenever I make fun of Ted and I kind of, you know, tease him and stuff, or he'll say something, I'll like roll my eyes and like do this with my finger. And then six months later, I'll find myself like saying the exact same thing, you know? So, so Ted's wacky and he has, he has a, a kind of a mental patience way of expressing himself. But a lot of what he's talking about is on the money and he's kind of ahead of it and he's not afraid to express experimental ideas. So my second trip down to the Copper Canyon, I trained for nearly a year for this race. I experimented with minimalist techniques. I was now meeting my, my first barefoot runner, Barefoot Ted. And I had this opportunity to run a 50-mile race, which I had previously nine months ago would have said, no way, impossible. And I got to, through this thing uh, unscathed. And that's what kind of opened my eyes to this idea. And an idea that I think would become my sort of fascination for the subsequent 13, 14 years, wherever it's been since then, you know, when, when I saw what the Tarahumara were able to do and the fact that it was not restricted by age and definitely not restricted by gender, you see men and women performing on an equal footing. It, it opened my eyes to a couple of things, which I feel like, again, I've been re researching ever since. You know, number one is we have been subject to such an amazing sales pitch over the past 30 or so years by the technology markets, by, by the shoe industry. They have kind of blasted away the notion 
of natural movement and the resiliency of the human body and replace it with that kind of fear-based marketing, which is if you don't buy the right thing, you will get hurt. You know, like that mafia technique. Hey, if you buy this, are you going to get hurt? And so, you know, we've, we've come to idolize shoes and to this day. Like, you know, that, that new Nike Air Zoom Super Orbit, fuck it, it's called, you know, that thing, you know, you can shave a nanosecond off your marathon time. You know, it's like they talk about with bikes too. Like the guys that go out there and just they shave a gram off their bike as opposed to like, you know, actually do the training and maybe shed 10 pounds off of your own body before you worry about the carbon fibers in your body. And we do the same thing with shoes. You know, we would much rather go to the short store and buy a shortcut rather than take the time to learn the techniques, do the drills, and analyze our own biomechanical responses first. And so that to me was what it was all about. We have come to replace uh, technique with technology. That's, that's the first thing. And the second thing was, you know, when I was watching the Tabo Mata and I started to look into ultra marathoning, which again, to me in 2006 or so, again, was a brand new world. I had not met Scott Jork or anybody else um, in the ultra running world. When I started to research that world, and you start to come across people like Chrissy Mel and Ann Trace and all these runners who are, if not winning the races outright, are pretty goddamn close. And to me, this isn't the only activity. This is the only sport that I know of where men and women are performing on almost an equal footing. And then when I start to look around a little uh, further and you start to look at long distance swimming, for instance, or in with running with Sherman, I get into burrow racing. What you find is anytime you get into sports that require adaptability and endurance, then you see the difference between men and women start to diminish. And I start to wonder, well, what's that all about? And uh, when I started to look into it, that's what led me down the road and eventually into the labs at, at Harvard University where I met up with, with uh, Professor Dan Lieberman and also down to... Um, Shepherdstown, West Virginia, to talk to Mark Cucuzella. What's so fascinating is that there was this evolutionary theory that was just coming out around that time, 2005, 2006, which looked at running as the human species' greatest physical art form. And Dan Lieberman's hypothesis was that humans evolved to run long distances. It wasn't this like punishment you had to do because you ate a little too much pizza. It wasn't this thing that was going to wreck your knees and be bad for your back. Um, instead, running was actually our greatest strength as a species. Well before we had any technology, we had this ability to run long distances. And you know what, what led Dr. Lieberman down that road was this, this mystery which had pervaded uh, evolutionary science for a long time. And, and the question was this, is that, they saw that the human brain had exploded in size about 2 million years ago. You know, we went from a kind of a little pea brain up to these like kind of massive melon heads with these big brains inside. But the first projectile weapons only evolved about 10,000 years ago. So the question was, well, if we needed animal protein in order to fuel these like big melon headed brains, so that meant somehow we're killing animals to eat. Yet we didn't have bows and arrows until like 10,000 years ago. So for like over a million years, how the hell are we killing these animals, which we had to eat in order to fuel our brains? And Dan Lieberman's hypothesis was we did it by running long distances. But the way we did it was by persistence hunting. That early humans out in the African savanna would go out as a group, as a hunting pack. And that's the key word there, pack. If me or Ken or anybody else goes out by ourselves to catch a gazelle, we're coming home empty-handed. But if me and Ken and everybody else on this call, if we go out in the savannah together and we pick out a herd of gazelles and we figure out which is the one we're going to break off from the herd and we all go out to chase it. And let's say Ken is a better tracker than I am. So he's going to go point. He's going to be the guy tracking it to make sure we keep chasing the right gazelle and don't get sidetracked into another one. And then, uh, you know, Lauren and I will flank it and keep driving and driving it. And we'll grab who's, you know, Alex and who's that, Catherine, who looked pretty spry. And we'll say, okay, this thing's getting tired. You guys go. And we send the young bucks out to run it to the, to the finish line, to run it to death. 
that's how early humans were able to run animals into heat exhaustion. And what's fascinating is, if you look today, because the uh, Kalahari Bushmen to this day still do persistence hunt, uh, hunting, and if you look at how long it takes them to run a gazelle to death, it's roughly between two and five hours, which just tracks almost perfectly to finishing time for the marathon. You know, like, why is it we picked 26.2? You know, was it really Phidippides? Or is it the fact that for tens of thousands of years, we evolved to run two to five hours on a hot day as a group in order to survive? So again, all these strands come together, and it led me to this, this idea that maybe our focus for a long time has been misdirected. We have come to idolize activities that rely on male attributes, you know, explosive power and upper body strength. We, you know, we, we get all excited about the fucking super, sorry about the F-bombs. Uh, I think I'm zooming back on my own Zoom call. Um, we've come to get all excited about the Super Bowl and baseball and basketball, you know, power sports. These were activities invented by dudes for other dudes to watch from the, t from the sofa. But these are not activities that humans evolved to do naturally. We invented these things. The activities we evolved to do naturally rely on adaptability, cooperation, and above all else, extreme endurance. So all this stuff comes together. And coincidentally, it's what's boiling through my mind at the time that we took in a rescue donkey in Peach Bottom, Pennsylvania. It was a complete series of accidents. We ended up with a donkey in our backyard and a very uh, strong-willed and take-no-nonsense trainer, our friend Tanya, who kind of drilled through my head that if you're going to have a rescue animal, you can't just leave it out there tied to a fence post and hope it's going to get better. Every creature needs a purpose. You know, it needs this, this sense when it wakes up in the morning that it's got to go ahead and it's got to get out there and get it done. And so her task to me was find a job, find a job for this animal. And one thing I know about myself is that, you know, if you tell me to do something and it's a requirement, I'm just not going to do it. But if I feel like doing it and it's fun, I'll go out there and do it every day. So one thing I like to do was, was to go running. So I got this thought in my mind about, you know, what if, what if I taught this donkey how to be my running partner? You know, if I got to give it purpose and I have to go out and run with it every day, uh, you know, maybe that's what we're going to do. We'll just go out and, and, and see if we can become running buddies. And that led me to my next thought, which was, hey, if we're going to be running, why not racing? And I, I knew about the Packboro races in Colorado, this old mining tradition dating back to like the 1800s of uh, prospectors running alongside their donkeys for up to 29 miles. So that became really the, the starting point of running with Sherman. It was this question of whether I could take what I'd learned in the past about training myself apply it to the least trainable creature on planet earth that's not me, which is a donkey, and take it to the point where he and I could go to Colorado and jump into this whole strange new world of burrow racing and compete in the world championship pack burrow race. So I've been running my mouth now for like 20 straight minutes. I got plenty more, but I'm just going to take a beat here. And then uh, why don't we open up to questions and maybe, you know, we can go from there. Okay, we've had a few questions come in um, through the chat box. Cool. One of them is, is, how important is the role of having a group versus training alone when it comes to ultra running? And how, and how should you balance this time? I'm going to answer half of that question, then I'll kick it over to Ken. Um, you know, I'm personally at war with myself because I feel like by nature I'm a solitary runner, and yet – the more I research, the more I think that's a bad idea. Uh, I, I think that we evolved as a running group. I find that every time I run with the group, the runs are better and better. When I was training with Sherman, one thing we discovered early on was that if it was just going to be me, me and Sherman, we never would have left the driveway. We would have we gone nowhere. Uh, and the only way to solve the problem of running with a donkey is to keep throwing more donkeys at the problem. And so – once we had a pack of three donkeys and three runners, it was easy. Like every run was a breeze. And I couldn't help but look at that and think, they're operating off of instinct. Their instinct is, if we're in a herd, it's party time. 
if we're by ourselves, this is a chore. And so I think that extends to human, human as well. But I, I'm also kind of wrestling with whatever kind of formation I've had, I just feel like running by myself. So I'll kick it over to Ken. What's your thought about that? Well, I think that the social aspect is a huge part. We spend so much time training that to do it by all by yourself will be very isolating. Um, I do think though, out on the race course, we're going to be by ourselves. So I think some people do all their training in groups and that doesn't prepare you psychologically for race day, which is going to be lonely and solitary and you need to manage everything yourself. So maybe the uh, best answer is kind of like training at altitude, you know, do some up there, some down below, you know, do it in your group and every once in a while break away and, and uh, test yourself as a solo performer. All right. Um, the next question is, you mentioned a book called um, Running with Sherman. Has it been um, published? And also, have you written any other books or have any other books um, on the way? Yeah, Running with Sherman is out now. Uh, it actually just came out in paperback. So, um, it is available on Audible, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, have you listened to the audio book, Ken? I have. What I have. do you think, dude? How is I, it? Great. I think it, it's a, a perfect listen. You get 12 hours of training um, by yourself, but with, with Chris McDougall. Because uh, that's the first time I've recorded one of my own books. And to this day... I haven't even listened to a sample of it. You know, it's that um, voicemail recording fear you have. It's like, Ugh, I'm not sure what this is going to sound like. So but it's way better when it's your voice than hiring someone to do it. Yeah, it's funny. So, and as an answer to the sort of the, the other part of the question was, I have another book called Natural Born Heroes, which came out right after Born to Run, where I really started to do, I think, a deep dive into the whole question of natural movement, natural human elasticity. It's looking at World War II resistance fighters. And, um, you know, I'd heard about this amazing story on the Greek island of Crete, where a band of resistance fighters kidnapped a German general and then went on the run for a month and took this dude up and down through these canyons around this island for 40 days before they finally got him off the island. And I'm asking myself, how on earth can a gang of civilians because that's what the resistance fighters were. They're just civilians. How can they go on the run from the most lethal army in the world and just run up and down these mountains every day and living off the land? Like physically, how the hell do you pull this off? And that's what the story of Natural Born Heroes is, is, is all about. And again, so it led me to the, the questions of diet, nutrition, training. But for that book, when the audio was going to be done, the uh, audio director said, hey, you know, who do you want to do the audio? Do you want to do it? I'm like, no, no, I know this guy who's a great, great reader, and he's a British guy. And the director's like, yeah, but you're not British. Doesn't matter. He's guy's really good. So now, for Natural Born Heroes, there's some British dude reading my, st my stuff out of my mouth with a really, you know, British Oxford accent. It might have been a, a bad decision. But anyway, to, to summarize, um, it's out in audio. And so three books out, Born to Run, Natural Born Heroes, and Running with Sherman. We'll have to check some of those out. Yeah. Um, the next question is, would you talk about the difference between the body type of the Tower of Mara and maybe the average American runner and the, and the consequences that result from this? You know, I'm actually going to kick that to Ken first. Ken, I bet you get that question all the time, dude. To me, um, my, my research started with African runners who grew up running barefoot um, and, and I think have a lot, lot in common with the Tower of Mara. And I don't think they're, you know, we, we think about the African runners as, you know, these, they were born at the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro. They had this incredible, incredible genetics. What first got me studying running technique was seeing VO2 max tests from the great African champions who were just crushing the Americans and their VO2 max wasn't any higher. They were just more efficient. So I, I don't think the Tarumara have this, this magic set of genetics. I think they grow up running and they never run in the Brooks Beast and screw up their feet and their technique. And I think, you know, the, the question is probably wondering about like body size, body mass, because this is something that I heard all the time. Whenever I would get injured and I would go to a doctor to ask, hey, why did I blow up my Achilles? Why do I got, you know, plantar fasciitis? Why do I got cuboid syndrome? And they'd always tell me, well, dude, look at you. You're like the size of Shrek, you know, you're six foot five and like 240 pounds. Of course you're hurt. 
you know, running's bad for the body, especially your body. And I, I think the huge misconception people have is that running's okay if you're a 110 pounder from the Rift Valley of Kenya, but it's bad if you're, you know, a big old mesomorph like me and or ectomorph, whatever, wherever the hell I am, endomorph, the big one, that one. And what I found again, now it's been, Ken, you know, since I started this stuff in like 2007, 2008, the one, my, my one real goal of running was I just wanted to be able to walk out the door on any given day and just run as far as I felt like in any direction. And that's what I've achieved. I'm not really concerned about racing or, or times or any of that. I just want that gift of running outside and just going for a five mile or, or a 15 mile or, or two mile. Hour. And I think that is available to anybody of any body size, body shape whatsoever, if, if you learn technique. Thank you. And then I have another question. Someone was wondering what happened to some of the main characters in the book, especially Jenny and Billy? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it's funny because I just talked to Billy like, so where you see me right now is a whole snowballing of weird events in the past year took us from our home in a farm in Pennsylvania to a house on Oahu, Hawaii. Uh, and I've been here now for the past 30 days. So huge, like major life change, but so is Billy. Uh, so Billy Barnett is living over on the big island and he's been there for a good few years. Um, and yes, I just talked to when I got here, I've had some great runs with Billy. Yeah. I was trying to remember if I wrote about it or not. I don't think I did. Yes. Yeah, so Billy. So, okay. Let me start from the beginning. So what happened was, first of all, we, we had this kind of World War I trench unit um, reaction after that race, which was really become kind of bonded for life. That race was in 2006. Yeah, 2006 was the race. So it's been, what, 14 years? And we've be, remained close ever since. Uh, I've had Barefoot Ted out to my house a bunch of times. I visited him. I've paced uh, Jen in races. I've paced Luis Escobar. Uh, I hear from Scott and his wife all the time. I don't know what it was about that experience, whether it was the weirdness of the adventure, which kind of bonded us, or the fact that we were the weird people that would do that adventure that kind of pre-bonded us before we got there. But we stayed tight ever since. And I believe that you know, when you write something about other people, the big fear is that you're just going to get it like way wrong, you know? And, and I feel pretty happy that I feel like I was kind of on the money um, about, about just about everybody that I wrote about in detail. So Barefoot Ted has uh, created his own uh, sandal company. He has Luna Sandals. I think I'm actually wearing a Luna one right now, which is a terrific running sandal. So Barefoot Ted is making sandals. He learned from... Uh, Manuel Luna. He actually named the company after Manuel Luna, who taught how to make sandals. Uh, Scott is living in Boulder. He set the Appalachian Trail speed record a few years back, which was then subsequently busted by like three other people. So he really sort of launched a whole heyday, a golden age of uh, AT speed records. Uh, let's see, Jen and Billy. So Jen is pregnant and living in Salt Lake City. Uh, just prior to getting pregnant, she spent a year working on a salmon boat in Alaska, of course. Uh, Billy is teaching special needs children, um, behaviorally challenged children on the Big Island. And from what I hear, he's just killing it, doing a great job. And who else? Lewis. Lewis has started the Born to Run Ultramarathon Extravaganza in Santa Barbara, California. And if you have a chance to go... Believe me, this thing's like the Woodstock. It's like the Burning Man of ultra races. Check out some videos online. It's got all kinds of crazy ass shit going on. Wrestling contests and archery and beer miles and 200 mile races. Uh, who else is there? Eric Gorton. I'm still in contact with Eric. Eric was super instrumental in training me for the Burrow Race for Running with Sherman. Uh, so he and I have remained close. So everyone's doing good and we're all, we're all still pretty tight buds. Yeah. And Eric's got a book called The Cool Impossible. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, what, what Eric did was, 
I think from working with me, he understood that there's a lot of people out there that had this kind of goal to think is really cool, but impossible. You know, and we, we probably all do like, man, would it be cool if I could like swim the English Channel or like hike Kilimanjaro, something like that. And it's cool, but it's impossible. And that's what he's all about. He wants people to come to him with what's your impossible dream and let's figure out how to make it happen. And he's at uh, runwitheric.com. Yep. Okay, and the next question is, has anything in the last 10 years um, happened that you would end up writing differently about Born to Run or has it confirmed the hypothesis? And also, if you were to write, a, be asked to write a forward to um, an edition of Born to Run, what would you write in the forward? Hmm. Well, I, I would definitely add an epilogue. And I, I've actually thought about this, and, and I might just do it. So I think it was exactly three years ago this past spring, I was in Agora Hills, California for an event. And my phone died on the way to the event. And when I got there, the event director said, oh, you've been getting these urgent calls from a woman named Maria who's been trying to reach you. And so I borrowed the phone and called this woman, Maria. And it was Ashley Caballo's girlfriend, Maria Walton. And she said, hey, uh, I've been waiting for Micah. And he has, he's, he's really late. He's supposed to be here yesterday. And I don't know where he is. And I'm like, well, you know, this dude's lived in the bottom of a canyon for 15 years. Like, you really expect him to be punctual? And then she said, um, no, he, he left Wadahuko tied up overnight outside. And Wadahuko is this crazy-ass smut dog that Caballo found in the bottom of the canyons. It seems like half wolf, but they've been inseparable ever since. And he never, ever is separated from that dog. I was in Boulder once with Caballo at some like fancy brew pub and we're sitting outside and he's got Wadahuko like in his arms and this, this wolf is like trying to like snatch people's burgers off their tables and so inappropriate, but so perfect with Caballo. Um, they were bonded. He would never leave this dog tied up overnight. So when Maria told me this, I, I just thought, uh-oh, like something, something is wrong. So I told her, hang on a second, let me, let me call Lewis. I'll get right back to you. So I called Lewis Escobar, who's in much closer contact with Caballo back then than I was. And I said, hey, man, did you talk to Maria? And when he answered, I could hear all this like traffic noise. He's like, yeah, I did. I'm in the car. I'm on my way there. I said, you're on your way where? New Mexico. So he was driving from Santa Barbara to uh, New Mexico immediately because he thought something is wrong. And Caballo's last sighting was in Gila Wilderness in New Mexico. So I said, listen, dude, by, by coincidence, I'm actually in California. I'm just south of you, I'm, I'm in LA. So I went in, gave my event, ran off stage, Lewis picked me up, and then we just drove straight down through the night and picking up other people, past Sweeney and other people along the way. And when we got there, Scott Jork was already there. The, um, oh, what the hell are their names? The, um, damn it. Anyway, these two brothers who are great uh, – names slip in my mind – ultra runners. Anyway, a, a, a gang of terrific ultra runners from around the country had already closed in on the scene of his disappearance. And for the next four days, we were out there just searching high and you know, far and wide. Uh, we found him. He, he had passed away. Uh, we still don't really know why. The best hypothesis was that he had contracted a parasitic uh, illness – down to Copper Canyon, and it uh, basically it, it ate away at the stem of his brain and, and caused irreparable damage, that, which killed him. But, you know, there, there are those days of walking up and down those hills searching for him with all of these terrific ultra runners and fans of his that rushed to the scene, like the second they thought he might be in trouble. They dropped everything and, and raced to the scene. And it, it led me to think that, you know, what he had always wanted to accomplish in life was to have people come together. And when, when he talked about his race, he always talked about it as a jamboree. He always wanted to make it like a, like a guitar battle, 
So you're not trying to beat the other guy. Everyone's just kind of riffing off of each other and, and joining the celebration. And I'm kind of looking around at this search for him. I'm like, dude, it's so ironic, but you kind of got your wish because everyone's down here together with one unified purpose, and that's to define you. So if I can put an epilogue on Born to Run, I wrote an article about that for Outside Magazine. And I look back on now, I think it's like the best thing I ever wrote because I was just very inspired by Caballo and what he had done. So that would be an epilogue. As far as, you know, whether I would second guess anything, uh, no, I, I kind of feel like, I feel like I wrote it at a really good time in my own understanding of the subject. If I had known a little bit more, I probably would have gotten stuff wrong. But I was writing it from a kind of defensive crouch because, again, the only barefoot runner I knew was Barefoot Ted, and I wasn't taking his word for anything. So I was very cautious about what I was saying. And I was basically saying, like, I don't know if this shit is true, but, you know, it's, it seems to make sense. There's a lot of evidence here. And so I feel like I, I hit the right tone in terms of, as far as I can tell, this minimalism idea is on the money. And it seems to be working for a lot of people. Let's see where it goes from there. I think that'd be very interesting. Uh, we have another question. While you generally advocate low tech for the running shoe, what do you think of other high tech stuff for long run, such as sun protection material, high tech fabrics, fuel hydration systems, um, that kind of thing, especially for really long runs and ones in the heat and high sun? Okay, that's, that's your department, I think. Me? Oh, yeah, Ken. Yeah, I think this is your department more, more than mine. Uh, I, yeah. I tell you what I think is that, that we haven't come up with any technology that's as good as a human foot. And so when you get the shoe to do something that the foot is supposed to do, it's a step backwards, not a step forward. The, the cushioning in shoes is spongy and it absorbs energy, but doesn't return it. Your elastic tissues absorb energy and return it, which works a lot better. So things like the high tech materials and all the other things are mentioned are great because they're not trying to do something that, that your body should do for itself. Yeah. I think Ken really zeroed in on the key point, which is don't add until necessary. And so with, you know, sun protection and other high tech things is like, if I'm going to be out in the blaze and sun, and my skin has got nothing natural there to block the sun, add something. You know, it's, it's almost the same um, theory used with, like, clothing. You know, like, hey, if it's not cold, don't put on a coat. Um, but if you need something, then add it. But I, you know, I think the idea is add as necessary as opposed to shop first, you know, think later. Yeah, let me interject something real quick there. Uh, about a year before Born to Run came out, um, Nike came out with a shoe called the Shocks which had these amazing springs in the heel. And they paid millions of dollars to Warren Sapp, who at the time was one of the, one of the best defensive linemen in the NFL. And if you watch the commercial, his heel never touched the ground. So he's got these shoes with these incredible springs in the heel. But Warren Sapp was a great natural athlete. And, and he just naturally used his own springs instead of these $200 shoe springs. I always thought that was really funny. Yeah, when you think about it too, you know, you know, an offensive back, he's going to be in a sprint mode all the time. Exactly. He would never come anywhere close to using those things. All right. Um, the next question is, I love running with German. How is the donkey clan, both human and donkey, and the farm? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, really well. Really well. So this was – this is one of those crazy adventures. You know, usually when you're writing a book, you have an idea – and you think about it for a while and you do some research and you, you, you kind of stress test it for a while to see whether the idea is something you're going to want to spend time with for two years before you, you start it. With running with Sherman, it was the opposite. I was in it. You know, it was happening around me before I even realized this was going to, this was going to be a story that could be a book. And one thing about it was I didn't know when the story was going to end. It could end the next day. You know, this donkey could have died in the first week. It could have died a month later it may have decided, hell no, I'm not running. You know, every step of the way could have been the last step. And so it was the, the one time in my writing career where I had no clue like where this thing is going and how it's going to turn out. 
and, and I'm really happy to share that it really exceeded our, our happiest hopes. Our goal for Sherman when he showed up was to try to reverse as much of the damage and psychological harm that had been done to him as we could. And the way we did that really, and when I look back on it now, I was like, you know, all of that tricky stuff, all the research I was doing in animal psychology, the answer really was just get him some more donkeys. You know, once he had flower Matilda, he was so freaking happy. And that was the big thing. But the second thing was, uh, when you read the book, you'll discover that we accidentally took in a third running partner, our, our good friend Zeke Cook, who was struggling with a really dangerous battle with clinical depression. And Zeke is one of these kids, man. Kind of reminds me of Anthony Bourdain. If you know anything about Anthony Bourdain, this guy was living the dream life. He had gone from being a line cook in a restaurant to being a celebrity uh, traveler and television personality. By all accounts, he was a super gracious guy, had a ton of friends. He's eaten noodles with Barack Obama and Saigon. This guy is living the dream life. And yet depression took him out. And you look at it and you go, how is this possible? So our friend Zeke was struggling with the same thing. And this was a really scary responsibility to have to be trying to train donkeys to run with and being responsible for this 22 year old who had just survived a very close brush with death himself and feel like any mistake I make could be really damaging to him. So now that it's, it's come and gone, Zeke is just super thriving. Um, he has applied to a ton of graduate schools. For, I, I think he's trying to like create his own human brain or something I don't even understand, but he was accepted like Cornell and Yale and Berkeley. So at last count, he's happy, he's healthy, he's strong, he's in graduate school. So uh, everyone involved in the, in the project has been doing super well. Thank you. And then it, there's another question. Um, 2020, um, needless to say, has been an unusual year. What particular resonance does the um, information and themes in Born to Run have for um, living in a global pandemic? That's a good one. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. All right, I'll, I'll take a swing at it. Uh, it's kind of a curveball, but um, I think a couple of things. I think one thing we've all had to come to terms with is all the sort of fancy plans we have for the future, all the stuff we thought we needed and wanted has largely been stripped away and we've had to fall back on smaller and more personal forms of satisfaction. And I think that is something, you know, when, when you look at the Tarumara, I think one thing that makes them so resilient as a group is that they are not materialistic. Uh, they are not, they are not greedy. Um, they live by cooperation, Like you cannot be a persistence hunting tribe and own a ton of shit at the same time, because if you're running 50 miles after gazelle. You can't be wondering whether someone stole your titanium bike back at the house. You know, you've got to travel light work as a group and really value personal interaction. That's got to be your credo. So I'm hoping that maybe if there's a takeaway, from this thing we're enduring right now is this idea of like, you know what, discard, 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 and zero in on cooperation, adaptability, um, personal elation, you know, from each other, as opposed to grasp and conquer and, and achieve. All right, and here's another one. Someone asked, how did you come up with the title of your book and are you a big um, Bruce Springsteen fan? <laughs> oh, for Born to Run. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, if I got a weakness, I mean, I probably got a, a lot of weaknesses, but one of them for sure is titles. You know, even for like headlines for articles, I'm always kind of like, I'll, I'll write a 30,000 word article and I, and I can't think of a headline. And it was the same with the book. So Born to Run was just a placeholder. I like, it made sense, seemed kind of obvious. So let's, let's just hold Born to Run there until we think of something better. And then it's time to publish and they're working on the cover. I couldn't think of anything better. And so we just stuck it on and left it there. And I say, thank God, because I can't, I still can't think of a better title than that. 
running with Sherman was almost the identical experience. So it was my editor at the New York Times who uh, gave me the idea of starting a, a series of articles about animal human partnerships. And so we did, I don't know, about eight or 10 of these articles. And before we began the series, she was like, hey, what do you want to call the series? And I'm suggesting all kinds of crazy stuff. And she's like, you know what? Trust your editor. We're going to call it Running with Sherman. I'm like, no, no, it's, 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 that's too simple. She's like, trust me, Running with Sherman. And so, again, in hindsight, keep it simple, keep it obvious. Because, you know, you don't want people to go into the bookstore and like, like what was that name again? Born to Run, you're not going to forget it. How's Sherman doing in Hawaii? <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, we thought long and hard about that, but fortunately we're on like an eighth of an acre here. So, so here's what happened with Sherman. Um, when we were getting ready to make the move, we started to ask around, like, you know, our first question was, what are we going to do with the donkeys? So we asked our farrier, this woman named Leslie, who trims the donkeys' hooves, and said, hey, like, do you know anybody who could take on three donkeys? Because they have to stay together. And she's like, right here, I'll take them. So she took all three donkeys. She, so she has 130 acres in Westchester, Pennsylvania with five other donkeys. So now suddenly Sherman has got his own like wild ass donkey pack. And so he's doing real well. So we left him behind. I think that was the best move for him. Um, okay, I have an, another question. Your book covers a lot of ground. How did you figure out how to call your material, organize it into a cohesive narrative and what did you learn about uh, the book writing process that um, you've applied to um, future endeavors? Yeah, it was really hard, um, especially with Born to Run. I, I think maybe I, I, I went through boot camp on that one because I wrote a draft and turned it into my editor. And he called me the next day. And he's like, yeah, you know, I'm thinking you should probably just start over, like shred it and start over because I was all over the place. And you know, it was, it was shiny object syndrome. Every, every new thing I heard, I was cramming into the book. And I had no, no focus whatsoever. Because again, all the stuff was new to me. You know, this idea of challenging the running shoe industry, brand new to me, you know, barefoot runners, brand new, biomechanics, never heard of it before. And so what I decided to do was figure, as Ken said earlier on, when he's talking about Mark Cucuzzello's book, is that you got to figure out what the story is. If there's not a beginning, middle, and an end that gets people's attention, you're not going to keep them around for very long. And so I had to take a step back and think, all right, what, what is the story here? And whose book is it? And it's really Caballo's book. And it's really a book about this guy. Because his whole arc from discovering the Tatumata to changing his own life to creating this race, that's really the span of the book. And so I thought, okay, the beginning is meet Caballo. The end is in a race. And everything else that fits between those two pieces of bread goes in the sandwich. And everything else that doesn't has got to be out. And so that's basically what I did. Uh, I, I did the same thing with Natural Born Heroes and uh, Running with Sherman. Figure out what the starting point has to be and what the end is. And then try to just kind of thread your way through where you can attach information to the drama so it all makes sense. Um, I, I've also have a writing background, so I found that particularly interesting. While transitioning into an ultra runner, did you have an important mantra to help you get through the tough runs? If so, what was it or what were they? Yeah, you know, Eric, Eric Orton was great for this. Uh, Ken, I bet you are. So Ken, actually, let me kick it to you, Ken. What's, what's the kind of little, little seeds of wisdom you plant in your athletes' minds? I, I think the biggest thing is, um, getting clarity on what you get out of a successful race. What, what is it you want? Because every endeavor has a cost and a benefit and the costs are in our face. We can't get, you know, when the alarm goes off at 4.30 and it's time to go for a run or at mile 20 when your legs are dying, the costs are right there. And so for me, getting clarity on what you get out of success and keeping that on the front burner um, is, is a big one. Also, I, I worked with a sports psychologist early in my racing career and she had me find a happy place, which was the, the moment when just everything went right. And she had me go, go when everything's got tough, go back just for five seconds and experience that moment. And it like, it changes your whole body chemistry. 
You know, it's funny, Ken, because you, now that I'm thinking about, I've actually looked at Born to Run in like 10 years. I haven't reread it in a long time. So I, I kind of forget what's in there. But as you're talking, I'm realizing, oh, yeah. So I quote you in the book. I'm sure I do. Because one of the things that you said to me the first time I met you was, most people are doing their slow runs too fast and their fast runs too slow. And that like clicked, like that's cool. And Eric Gordon had one, which was, what the hell was it? It was in the tip of my tongue and I just lost it. Oh yeah, if it feels like work, you're working too hard. And you know, that's a, that's a, that's a tricky thing to play with because there are certain moments when you should be working hard, but even during speed intervals, it really shouldn't feel like work, right? It should feel like excitement. Like if you're up there where you should be in the, in the right heart rate zone, you should feel kind of jazzed. You're in distress, you're working hard, but at the same time, there's that adrenaline push of like, this is hard, but I think I'm gonna pull this off. Exhaustion feels, goes with exhilaration. Yeah, right? Right? Exhaustion goes with exhilaration. Is that what you said, Ken? Yep. There you go, there's, there's a mantra right there. But what's interesting about that is, but if it feels like work, if you feel leaden, if you feel beat up, if you're just shoving your carcass through it, something's wrong. And so, yeah, if it feels like work, you're working too hard, your slow runs are probably too uh, fast, your fast runs too slow. And of course, Caballo had the classic, which again, it's slipping away, but easy, oh, here we go. Easy, light, smooth, and fast. That was one of the first things he said to me was, what you're aiming for is easy, light, smooth and fast he goes number one is easy because if that's all you get that ain't so bad and once you've got easy work on light so you're smooth and smoothly now you're working to make it feel light if you got easy and light work on smooth it's easy i'm light-footed and now i'm smooth you get those three together bam you got fast easy light smooth and fast so there, there, there's some pretty good mantras there I'll definitely have to remember exhaustion goes with exhilaration. That's a good one. That's new to me. Uh, I have another um, question. I'm trying to consolidate some of them. Do you know how the Taramara are doing? Have they run other races outside of Mexico since the book? And have any of the book proceeds gone to compensate the Taramara people? Uh, so let's see. Where to begin with that one? Um, the the Taramara are still in a rough and increasingly precarious situation. Um, the exact thing that Caballo was afraid of has, has happened. You know, he, he wanted to run his race in the Copper Canyon because he didn't want a few people to leave the Copper Canyon and go up to the U.S. and, you know, be on the cover of Sports Illustrated and then go back to the same volatile situation they were in before. Uh, what he wanted was he wanted the whole region and the whole culture to be appreciated and, and lionized, but, but above all, else protected. And so that's why he wanted his race on their home turf. And so for a good number of years, that plan was actually gathering momentum. Caballo was able to uh, make his race get bigger and bigger and bigger. And particularly when he started to date uh, Maria Walton, who came down and, you know, Caballo was a lot of things, but one thing he wasn't was a race director. And so Maria stepped in and did a fantastic job of bringing like the warmth and the organization to the race that it needed. So the race is doing, was doing really well. But then in 2000 and I think it was 15 or so, the drug cartels had pushed so deep into this territory that there's so much danger. I, I think like a, a, a police officer was actually dragged out of a police station down in Orique near where the race was by cartel dudes and like disappeared. So Maria had to cancel a race that year. It, it has been revised since then. Uh, and the Mexican government is putting in a good amount of protection, but it is still an increasingly volatile area because of drug cartel trafficking. Uh, a good number of Tarumada have been able to come up and compete in the U S whether it's a good thing or not, I, I'm not, I'm not really sure. Uh, when they come to Lewis's race in Santa Barbara, it's terrific because it's, it's Arnulfo, it's Silvino, it's the guys, Manuel Luna, it's guys that Ted and Lewis and I know personally. And they're very well protected and celebrated. There's a great picture of like a big dance party and Arnulfo is like waltzing around with one of the ultra runners and looks really cool. In that environment, they are treated like brothers and sisters and well taken care of. 
when they've been extracted and flown around the world for races, I, I just, I, I'm always concerned that they're being treated as human oddities as opposed to uh, human beings and, and athletes. So uh, that's something that they concern me. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, I always felt that it'd be better if people came down to the region and that region became protected as opposed to singling a few people out. So uh, basically I can tell you it's, it's still precarious and ongoingly a dangerous situation. All right, here's another question. What have been some of your biggest surprises about the reception to Born to Run, both positive and negative? Uh, yeah, so surprise, I'll tell you, the big surprise was um, that whole chapter on running shoes, I was like that close to cutting the whole chapter out because for two reasons. One is, if when you look at it, it's the one chapter that I really couldn't blend into the flow of the story. Like basically the story stops and that chapter we just talk about running shoes and then the story begins again. And I kept looking at this chapter like, man, this thing really is kind of like an emergency break. It just stops the story, dead. And the second thing I was concerned about was, you know, once you start to get involved in that world you start talking about like zero drop and minimalism and the rest of it after a while you feel like oh everybody in the world must know this already you know because you get involved in this little bubble where all the people you're talking to that's all they're talking about so you know talking to guys like ken and ted and you know the harpers out in, in utah and everybody who's so uh, fixated on this stuff so after a year and a half of working on this book i kind of thought oh everybody must know all this running shoe shit by now so why put it in the book? And at the last minute, I thought, eh, just in case, maybe I better leave it in. So that was a big surprise because I think, you know, when the book first came out, it was not uh, reviewed at all. You know, it got no reception whatsoever. It just kind of trickled along, you know, in the back of the bookstore. And bit by bit, it started to gather attention. And I think it only gathered attention because it took this information, which was very, very well known to guys like Ken, but still new to most of the mainstream public. And it took it from basically Ken's mouth to America's ears, you know? Uh, and that's why that chapter ended up being a surprise to me. Uh, it started negative surprises, you know, not, not anything really, other than, you know, the whole Bieber and Five Fingers thing became this flap, you know, this, 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 this argument. And I kind of look back on it sympathetically to the Vibram guys because I think they became victims of their own enthusiasm. Like, you know, one thing about running shoe companies is they don't promise you anything. You know, Nike never promises your shoe is going to do shit. They just put it out there. They suggest it's going to do a lot of stuff. You know, they suggest you'll go faster. They su suggest that pronation stuff will do something, but they never actually say what the shoe will do. Now the Vibram people come along and they'd never built a shoe before. They had uh, created a ton of souls, but this was their first shoe and they were converts, man. They were true believers. And so in their advertising, they said that these shoes will reduce your injuries. Well, there was no scientific evidence. They could actually prove that, you know, everyone believed it, but they couldn't prove it. And they just left themselves wide open in this lawsuit and they just got crucified for it. So that's, a, it's kind of secondhand regret because it, you know, it didn't really affect me at all. But I look back at those guys and felt like, ah, if they'd been a little more battle hardened, they would not have made that error. So when, when Chris was going to come down and do book signings, I talked to a whole bunch of running shoe stores. And there are three where I knew the owners, including Potomac River Running. I had coached Margie for many years and we were close. Um, and they kind of reluctantly agreed and about eight, nine, 10 running shoe stores where I just came out of the blue and they didn't know me were like, if he sets foot on this property, and they're like, no way in hell do we want him in our store. Yeah. You know, it's funny though, Ken, because, you know, no one knew what was going on back then, but in a little bit, it was a little bit short sighted because I think the overall effect of the kind of work we're doing is that if we can help people become bulletproof, you know, if we reduce injuries, then there are more runners buying more products, going to more races. And so really what I think you're doing running instead of switching to cycling, they'll buy more running yeah. shoes. Yeah. 
But basically what you're doing is you're, you're creating more runners in the world because you're giving them more longevity. You're reducing the fear factor. And so what running shoes stores back then for you to realize is that, look, dude, if we can help your runners out and get them out in the streets, it's ultimately going to profit you. And I think with, with the, the, the quote advanced running shoes and with orthotics, it's not this scheme of the running industry or podiatrists to injure people and make a lot of money off them. It's, it's just sort sighted. They, they put someone in this shoe and their knee hurt yesterday and today it doesn't. And they're, they're, they're treating the symptom, but making the cause worse, but they're not aware of that. You know, Nike didn't set out to make plantar fasciitis runners all over the country have plantar fasciitis. Yeah, I mean the culpability thing, you know, it never it never helps to try to point fingers. Although I think I did in Born and Run, I think I said, you know, it's easy to point the finger at Nike, but that's okay because it's their fault. But in a way, the reason I, I don't want to let them off the hook is because number one, when they came out with the Nike Free, they knew, yeah, like they knew, they were up there with Vin Lanana at at Stanford, and like this guy's got his guys running barefoot. Um, but the second thing about it was, I, I think what bothers me is this confusing what we can build with whether it can actually work. So they're putting shit on the shelves before they have any clue what it's going to do. You talked about the shocks, you know, things were kept going higher, higher, higher with those shocks. And then they, you know, then it went down to nothing. And now we're looking at maximalists where the, the, the drop is minimal, but the foam is increased. But it's 32, 32. Yeah. Zero so you're basically, it's a it's a flat surface, but the flat surface is like is like that thick. It's like running and on so, a paper towel roll. Yeah, but what's interesting about that is a lot of runners that are super successful that I really respect and really know what they're doing love love those maximalist shoes. And so my thing is, but we don't really know. Like I don't know, you don't know. So anyway, that's my, that's my concern with them is they keep rushing stuff to market with no idea if this stuff's going to help or hurt. But it's going to make money. But it will it will sell. Here's another question. It's a little bit different. How have, how have you used your journalism background um, in your book writing career? And are you now doing um, book writing full time for your career? Yeah, you know, so journalism was, was great, um, a great proving ground because for, for a couple of reasons. I think one is it basically, um, you know, books begin and end with research. You know, I, I think the thing with Born to Run, that was my first real book. I'd actually written another book prior to that called Girl Trouble, which is why I always refer to my first book as Born to Run, because uh, Girl Trouble was, a, was, a, was an interesting experiment. But um, with Born to Run, I really fell back on what I had done for years as a particularly news journalist for the Associated Press, which was like kind of run rumors down to earth. I'd heard about minimalism. I heard about barefoot running. I heard about these evolutionary theories. And what I wanted to do was get as close to the primary sources as possible. So when I was trying to find out about running technique and I heard about Ken and Ken's down in Annapolis and I started to call him and drive down to Annapolis and then saw him a couple times. So I, I want to get as close to original sources as possible for the information. Dan Lieberman. So with Dan Lieberman, it was kind of funny because he had written a scientific paper in nature about called born to run actually about this evolutionary hypothesis and i contacted him up at harvard in the evolutionary biology department and actually got him on the phone he was very excited and he was basically trying as quickly as possible to get me off the phone he's a nice guy but too busy to talk to another journalist and i was basically begging him to come up to his lab and he's saying no 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 and then he paused and he goes well wait a second Maybe you can help me out. So I'm doing an experiment. And for this experiment, I need to find a one-armed ultra runner who runs with his prosthetic on. Don't give me a guy that runs without the prosthetic. I got a million of those. I need a guy with the prosthetic. And he's like, if you can find me this guy, then come on up to, to Cambridge and I'll give you all the time you want. And luckily back then, you know, it was, it was so easy in the ultra community, which was so small that I, I forget what the, what the thing was like ultra net or something like that. But I just like, popped a question online and like, hey, does anybody know a one-armed ultra runner that runs with the prosthetic? And people are like, oh yeah, you, you want you want one arm Willie out in San Diego. Like, here's his cell number. So I called this guy up, and he was willing to go up to Cambridge to do an experiment with uh, with Dr. Lieberman. 
and that's what got me into the lab for the first time. But to me, like that really harkened back to the old sort of news writing, track people down, knock on their door, get what you need. And uh, that became, again, instrumental, I think for all my books, getting to the source and kind of wringing out all the facts you can. Thank you. We have about 10 more minutes. Thanks for sending um, all these great questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm curious how you would apply what you learned about running, she's working on Born to Run, to running in an urban environment. Can we get the same benefits of barefoot running by running with minimalist shoes part of the time and shoes with sticker soles at other times, such as if we're worried about having plantar fasciitis or other injuries? Oh. Okay, that's definitely you, man. So the, the answer to that is definitely yes, um, absolutely. The, the key with going down to a more minimalist shoes is it is a very, very, very long-term process. W one of the bad things that happened after Border Run came out is people went from the Brooks Beast and went out and bought five fingers. And it's like, oh, my knee feels great. Of course, I ripped the calf out. I can't run for six months. Um, and, and so then that turned a lot of running shoe stores totally against the idea of minimalism. So the, the key is get, get a pair that is slightly more minimalist than what you're running in now and, and go with two pairs. Do your long run in a heavier shoe and use a lighter one for your midweek shoes. And then four or five months later, whenever it's time for you to get another pair, go down one more and use what was your midweek shoe for your long weekend run and get a slightly thinner pair. Uh, but but very, very gradually go down like two millimeters at a time. Because uh, if, if you're running in the Brooks Beast, you've created a circumstance where you have weak, tight feet and you need the Brooks Beast. You know, Ken, I think one thing that I've wrestled with, and I'm actually working on a new book now that examines this idea, but one thing I've wrestled with, and you must see it all the time too, is this focus on competition. And I can free myself from it more easily than you can because you're a coach and you are training athletes who are aiming. Well, everybody can free themselves from it this year. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just curious. And are people doing that, Ken? Are they shifting their focus away from competition to, to different goals? I, I, some are. Some are just, I, I have clients that are still working um, towards next year or just towards improving. And others have just stopped coaching and plan to pick up when the racing starts again. So, so yes to both. So, Forget you know, I wonder, I wonder if this wouldn't be a good time for you to tell your clients, you know what, let's make this the year of technique. Mm -hmm. That's our goal. And it's become like my only goal now. Um, I will occasionally get in races, but I really sort of don't even care about them anymore. It's always like more hassle than it's worth. The only races I really enjoy are, uh, Ken, did you ever do the Bird in Hand Half Marathon up in um, Pennsylvania? No, never did. So this is a, an exclusively Amish run race. So the local Amish community up in Bird in Hand, which is a traditional Amish community, created this half marathon as a way of raising money for the volunteer fire company who were first responders for the, um, the, uh, the nickel mine uh, massacre in, in a uh, Amish schoolhouse. So I'm guessing it's not a chip race. I'm trying to remember if it is timed or not. It is timed. It is timed, but not by chips. Good. How is it? Anyway, okay, I gotta think about that. Because the Pretzel City guys, Ron Horn at Pretzel City does the timing. I forget how he does it. But so what's cool about this race is that it feels like a it feels like a, a, a summer a summer fair. It's in a in a cornfield with a big tent. Uh, there's no music, there's no noise. So that's basically the only race I really like want to go to. And I can like come ripping up five minutes before the start, park the car jump in, you know, pay afterwards for your number. It's super informal, but really good race. But what I do think about all the time is technique. Like the lessons you taught me have never left my mind. Every run I go on, I'm constantly doing diagnostics. And I think some people look at that as ruining the run, but to me, it completely makes it exciting, like and interesting. Never I'm constantly, right, because you're, you're constantly thinking about it. You're not trying to like shut it out with your headphones, but like, Am I dragging my leg? Am I popping my foot off the ground? Am I driving with my knee? You know, is my back up? And anytime you feel a twinge somewhere, you, you can correct it. So to me, like technique is what it's all about. It's all I really care about anymore. Um, I guess that I'll probably make this the last um, question because we're trying to um, finish by 8.30. 
What are the What are you most looking forward to now? Any new big goals or bucket list items you're working towards? <laughs> yeah, but um, it's kind of ridiculous. So now that we're living in Hawaii, I was at a basketball court. This is pre-pandemic, and there's a little guy in his mid sixties. And someone said to him, like, hey, Dave, man, did you go body surfing this weekend? He's like, yeah, North Shore, 10-footers, but Hawaiian 10-footers, which means like 20-footers. And this 64-year-old dude was body surfing 20-foot waves. And I was like, no, that's interesting. So I said, could you take me out and, like, teach me body surfing? So uh, if you have a chance, after this, go, go, on, go on YouTube and find videos by this guy named Kailani. Kailani, it's a Kailani gift of heaven. This is a dude that body surfs at Nazaré in Portugal. He body surfs like 60 and 70 foot waves. Him and a pair of fins, nothing else. So what I'm looking at, and I bet you Ken's got the wheels turning already. What I'm looking at is I'm curious whether this indigenous island technique of body surfing is something that can become universalized to teach us more about how our bodies perform in water. So yeah, my goal this year is to die a horrible death off the coast of Oahu with my brains spattered across some rocks on the North Shore. That's what, that's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, just one more question. Um, you mentioned that you're in Hawaii. Um, why, um, why, ha why Hawaii? And are you involved with the University of Hawaii or um, something else? Um, we're here because my wife grew up here. This is her home. And she moved to Pennsylvania. She thought only for one year and then uh, met me and everything spiraled down after that. So <laughs> she had like 20 years of living around Philadelphia when she thought it was going to be one. And so we'd always thought in the future at some point we would try to give her a chance to move home. And the more I came here too, the more I liked it. So we were able to pull it off. Thank you. I think they have an Ironman there actually. Yeah. Is it, are they actually going to do it this year, Ken? They're not. They, they moved it to February um, and then canceled it. Yeah, that's, that's that seems very wise. Well, that sounds like a great place to be. And um, on behalf of all of the DC Triathlon Club, I want to thank you for taking um, an hour and a half today to um, talk with us. And um, your book is really interesting and I look forward to uh, reading your other two books. <laughs> great, thanks everybody. Thanks Lauren, thanks Ken. Thank you, Lauren. Nice. You're welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Great, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. And if you have um, book um, ideas, please send them to, um, to me because we're looking forward to our, our next book uh, meeting. Most likely our last one for 2020 will be sometime in November. <laughs>